Is everybody, uh, everybody hear me? The microphone's working. So I'm, yeah, I'm Toby Pennington. I'm at the University of Exeter, but I'd also like to point out I've got a joint appointment at the Royal Botanic Garden in, in Edinburgh as well. So I come from that botanic garden world that's very well represented at this very diverse meeting. And what I want to talk to you today is a little about the dry areas of the tropics, which I think are rather neglected by science and society. So apologies to particularly people from Kew who will have seen this slide before. I've been in this lecture theatre a couple of times over the last year. I often show this slide at the beginning of talks because I think it shows very well how for a very long time when people think about the tropics, they think about this biome, tropical rainforest. So this comes from Martius's Flora of Brazil, a very serious scientific work, a complete documentation of Brazil's flora published in the 19th century, but which also has, if you go into the library in Edinburgh or here at Kew, this fantastic folio volume of illustrations of different vegetation types in Brazil, mostly of rainforest. It's a serious <coughs> scientific work, but this slightly sensationalised depiction here, I think, was about those early explorers wanting to, wanting to tell people about how fantastic this vegetation was in terms of its sheer scale, the size of the trees, and in terms of its biological diversity. And that, I think, has led to a common conception, particularly, I think, in the global north, that what we find in the tropics is just this rainforest. But what I want to talk about today is that more than half of the tropics is seasonally dry, too seasonally dry to support rainforests and in a or meeting organised, it's a fantastic meeting organised by Plants, People, Planet to make the point that a third of the world's population lives in these tropical dry seasonal areas. They're a frontier for agricultural expansion, but a lot of those populations, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, are amongst the world's poorest people. They depend on these systems for food, for firewood, for ecosystem services in general. So these are very important systems. And so the systems I'm talking about, which I'll tell you about in more detail in a minute, are tropical dry forests and tropical savannas. And what you see here is a map depicting in a schematic way where those three main lowland tropical biomes are found across the tropics, in, in my view. So, a bit of a boring slide, but I think definitions matter. I'm going to be using the word biome in this talk a lot. What do I mean by that? There's a definition from the paper where that map comes from. Here's a paper published just at the end of last year, a new phytologist, really interesting paper about the use of that word in science. But for me, biomes are major vegetation types that apply at global scales. And they're vegetation types, as I'm trying to explain to you in a minute, that are biologically really different. So what are the biomes I'm talking about? So this is the one I started with from von Martius. There's a picture taken during my own PhD in that rainforest biome. These are the kind of typical cliché depictions we see of these wet tropical forests that are tall, they have a continuous canopy, and they occur in areas that have high precipitation and precipitation that's generally quite continuous throughout the year. If there's a dry season, it's not a very severe one. I think people don't really argue about what a rainforest is, but people are much more confused about what, for example, a tropical savanna is. And so tropical savannas, if I say the word savanna, you all think of grasses, but most tropical savannas do have trees, but they're not forests because they're open. And in that open ground layer, we see grasses generally, often photosynthesizing using a C4 pathway. These areas have a strong dry season, but in the wet season, they're quite wet. Those glasses grow well. In the dry season, they dry. They act as fuel for fires that are a natural part of this system. The woody plants in these systems are adapted to fire. They often need fire to reproduce. And what ecologists have found is if we increase fire in these systems, they become increasingly open. So those varying levels of openness are, in a sense, a natural phenomenon that people can really modify. So those are all pictures of savannas in the New World. And another biome I'm going to talk to you about are tropical dry forests, which is one I've done most of my own research on. And they're very different from savannas, even though they can grow under exactly the same climates. They grow where soils are better, and that may result in the fact that trees can grow better, which closes the canopy, which doesn't favour grasses. And so even though they have a strong dry season, they don't burn. And one of the signs they don't burn is that they're full of the kind of succulent plants that Olwyn Grace was talking about this morning. 
And that gives an ecological clue about fire, because those succulent plants, they can't survive fire. So a little experiment we could do after the meeting today is go to the Princess of Wales Conservatory that Olwyn told us about and set light to it. <laughs> and we'll see how many of those cacti are growing next week. It won't be very many, so those cacti and other succulents. So that is a brief tour through those major biomes. And I want to talk a little bit now about something that I'd like to call biome blindness. So one of the reasons I'm really delighted to be involved with Plants, People, Planet is it's at the vanguard of curing this problem of plant blindness. But I think there's a kind of supra-property going on, which is people forgetting major vegetation types. And here's a good example why this matters. So this was in the news, these images last week, that global news about fires in the Amazon. And when this first appeared over global media outlets, this satellite picture, it was in the context, well, why are people singling out Brazil for all this criticism when there's much more going on in Africa? But look where those fires are in Africa. They're occurring in the savanna biome. They're occurring in a biome where fires are natural and it's not a problem. And similarly, Brazil's getting a lot of criticism, but most of the fires are in the savanna region of Brazil, the Cerrado. So I'm not saying there's not a problem with Amazon fires. What I'm saying is we need a proper biome lens to analyse these problems properly. And moving on from that, these biomes are incredibly important for their biodiversity. So again, picking on savannas, I think if you ask the general public <coughs> what biodiversity is important in those savannas, they pull out these mega herbivores, your giraffes and your elephants and your rhinos. I don't think anyone would mention plant diversity. But given this is a meeting about plants, I'd like to dwell a little bit on what the species richness is in these biomes at global scales. So again, I think if you ask people what the most species rich biome is in the tropics, they would all say rainforests. But I want to show you some figures now that might challenge that. So the first figure I'm going to show you comes from the successor to Von Marsh's Flora of Brazil, the Flora of Brazil project, which is a fantastic collaborative work. Globally, many scientists at Kew were involved in this. A flora for the whole of Brazil, which has allowed us to produce species numbers for the different major biomes in Brazil. For all flowering plant species, that's everything from herbs up to trees, in the Brazilian Amazon, there are 11,349 species exactly in their 2010 list. <laughs> if we go to the Brazilian Cerrados, this is 2 million square kilometres of savanna in central Brazil. Would anyone like to tell me how many species there are in the Brazilian Cerrados? Is it more or less than the Amazon? Maybe I'm hearing a few mores because you knew I was going to say more. <laughs> so it is more, it's 35 more, only just. <laughs> but I think that would surprise a lot of people. And what's really important to realise is that 30% of those species are endemic. They grow nowhere else. And that matters again. And so Richard Bugs mentioned at the beginning of his talk, we need to plant more trees. And of course I agree with that but we don't necessarily need to grow more trees everywhere. So this, again, is a very recent paper. It was all over the global media. Some of the things that Richard showed came out of that paper. And this was saying that if we plant trees in lots of places, we can really mitigate effects of increasing CO2. This is the, a figure from their paper, and the areas in green, areas where they're suggesting there is potential for tree planting. But many of those areas are tropical savannas which should be open. And so to be fair to these authors, there are some kind of mitigating statements at the end of their papers saying we need to be careful which biomes we plant trees in. But for me, this kind of figure we need to be very careful with because some decision maker is going to grab hold of that and say, well, let's plant loads of trees in the savannas of central Brazil. Those trees will probably be eucalyptus going on what is being planted there at the moment. And that would be an ecological disaster for those 10,000 species that are growing in the Brazilian savannas, which depend on fire in an open system. So afforestation, which this article is really advocating in tropical savannas, is problematic. So savanna commu uh, ecology community is... I think you should look out. I think there'll be articles coming out that are basically trying to balance this view. So just to be clear, I'm not saying that planting trees does not have a role, but we need to think about the biomes we're doing it in. So moving on to tropical dry forests. So this is where I've been doing a lot of research work. And this is 
a paper that was published in Science by the Dry Floor Network that I was involved in founding. It's led by Dr. Karina Banda, who worked with me as a PhD student in, in Edinburgh. And that dry floor network was about trying to get a list of species for the whole of that biome across the new world. That's kind of tricky because most species lists, that Brazil one I showed you is just for Brazil, are done at national level. And countries, in some sense, it's hard to get everyone to cooperate. So what we did in that network is got a whole bunch of experts working on dry forests from throughout the new world that have done inventories where they go to areas and count species, and we just compiled a database. And although there was some science in that paper about floristic relationships, maybe the headline from it for me was the number of species we found in just 1,600 inventories. 7,338 species of woody plants. So this is the woody plants only. Trees and big shrubs. So again, just to contextualise that, there's a lot of argument at the moment about how many woody species there are in Amazonia. But ones that are compiled in this way, that aren't based on, on, on modelling what we don't know in Amazonia, have similar numbers of species. I think tropical dry forests, because this is so few inventories, over the whole continent may be more species rich than tropical rainforests. Again, I think that's a, a fact that will shock a lot of people. And that's important. It's important for, for me as a scientist thinking about evolution and biogeography, and it's very important for conservation. And so for some of the big science questions, it's very important to realise the dry topics don't obey some so-called rules or even laws, people call them in macroecology. That diversity is highest near the equator. Mexican tropical dry forests have more species in them than any others in the New World, and they are a long way from the equator. And we see this throughout science. I haven't put any authors on this. I don't want to be, be, be kind of pulling people out. This was published this year, again, was covered by the media. It's a brilliant paper about how connectivity is going to be affected by climate change in tropical forests, was the title. If you look at it, it's only talking about rainforests. So if I'd have been editing that, I would have just asked for one small change, because the paper was so good, is could they please add one little word to the title to get the biome specification correct? Fortunately, and in my new position in Exeter, I'm surrounded by earth system scientists, they're starting to take these dry biomes very seriously. And what's interesting is if we look at what they call the interannual variability of the carbon sink, so how much carbon the oceans and terrestrial ecosystems are taking up, very interestingly, and it was thought to be driven by tropical rainforests, a lot of that variability is accounted for, it seems, by these biomes growing in semi-arid areas. And what people think is going on is when it rains a lot and rains can be erratic those biomes grow a lot and they're fixing a lot of carbon so that's good but thinking about conservation that's something I compare passionately about how these biomes are doing how are they doing in these times of global change and population growth so this is specifically relating to Latin America, so that's a picture of Amazonia. Again, I took many years ago during my PhD, but I'll guarantee if you threw, flew over that bit of forest, it's actually in Guyana now, it would look exactly the same. Because despite the bad news about Amazonia, and I'm not saying we need to be complacent, 80% of it's left. It's a great place to work. It's one of the world's last wildernesses. The Brazilian Cerrados, the savannas of central Brazil, more than 50% has disappeared in my lifetime. And these tropical dry forests that I work on are perhaps the most world's most endangered tropical forests with less than 10% remaining, for example, 5% in Colombia. So they're in real trouble. And if we look at how well preserved they are, so this is, was part, again, of this paper, how well protected they are, they're not well protected. So the HE target for protected by protected areas is 70%. Again, figures from Brazil in the Caatinga dry forest of northeastern Brazil, only 7.7% is protected in any form of protected area, with only 1.2% in national parks. Again, compare that to what Brazil has done in the Amazon. The figures don't stack up. These dry biomes are being neglected. And the future of them, because they're so destroyed, needs to restoration is going to be a really important part. And this is where my co-author, Lucy Rowland, who's a brilliant scientist at Exeter, she's a, a, a physiologist who works on drought in tropical plants. 
Restoration needs to come in, but it's restoration at a massive scale. So things like the Bond Challenge have suggested that amounts of areas that countries need to restore. Some countries like Brazil have signed up to the Bond Challenge. They've actually made it law, and that is committing to Brazil to restore 5 million hectares in, for example, the savannah region of central Brazil. So how are they going to do that? It's going to be tricky. So if we grow plants as seedlings and plant them, it's really expensive. So these are collaborators of Lucy's, Isabel Schmidt, Alexandre Sampaio. They estimate that it can cost 7,000 US dollars a hectare to do that restoration. So there are some cheaper ways of doing it, which amazingly for dry forests can in consist of scooping up soil from an area like a road, you're destroying it, dump it on an old pasture, and because of the ability to sprout from the roots, you can get really good regeneration. So apparently that mostly comes from roots rather than seeds. But the cheapest way of doing that restoration is going to be by planting seeds. But the issue here is the scale and the amount of seeds that are going to be required. So there's some amazing work being done by mainly non-governmental organisations in Brazil developing community seed networks. That seed is going to have to be sourced locally, I think, from natural vegetation. But how are we going to do it at this scale? And one thing that worries me with the current political situation in Brazil is a lack of support for those non-governmental organisations. So sorry to be a bit political, but they are suffering under the current regime. They're the ones that are organising these seed networks. These seed networks could be really powerful. They offer local people an income stream from private landowners who need to buy the seed to meet those legal requirements. But the non-governmental organisations are needed to build the capacity for those networks and to make more of them. And what we need is more science. And so Lucy has just got a grant from NERC in the UK and for PESPI, the Sao Paulo Research Council, which is fantastic, to look at barriers to restoration success. And, and in a nutshell, what we need to do is understand much more how these plants are growing in these difficult environments and which of them are going to do better under changing climates. And in this project, we're taking advantage of, this is science on a massive scale. This is a restoration experiment in Rio Grande do Norte in the dry forest of the Caatinga, where in this block design, they're looking at how different combinations of species may facilitate each other better for successful restoration. But there's much more science required. So sorry, this is my last slide if I'm a little bit under time. My main simple, oh, sorry, over time. My main simple points are this issue of there's more than rainforest in the tropics, that those dry biomes are biologically special and important to people, and that more work is needed on them if we're going to restore them properly. And I'd like to thank you for listening and thank all my collaborators in the Dry Floor Network for their support over the years. Thank you.